Gettysburg traveled to Goodman Field to take on the undefeated Eagles of Juniata. Here, Zach McCauley picks up 40 of his game high 103 yards, bursting off left tackle deep into Gettysburg territory. That set up Ward Udinsky's first touchdown pass of the day, this one covering 17 yards to Devon Mitchell and Juniata led 7-0. Gettysburg came right back. Quarterback Zach Miller drops back and hits Fred Polzello for 15. Eddie Hutchins takes his pitch around the right side and picks up 14 more. Miller caps the drive with a 19-yard touchdown pass to Tommy Lenore. The, few, the extra point attempt was blocked and Juniata led 7-6. The Eagles came right back. Udinsky looks for Isaiah Slutter for 24 yards. Then Aaron O'Brien fakes to the inside, breaks to the outside, and Udinsky hits him with a 27-yard touchdown pass to put the Eagles up 14-6. Gettysburg wouldn't yield. Miller scrambles out of trouble, gains 18 yards deep into Eagle territory. That set up Matt Perkins and his 39-yard field goal, closed the deficit to 14-9. Udinsky scores on a quarterback draw to put the Eagles back up by 12 at 21-9, and then the key play of the first half, Kevin Gorman picks off this mower pass off the tip, giving the Eagles good field position with three minutes to go. Udinsky takes advantage, throwing deep for Colton Myers, 33 yards for the touchdown, and Juniata took a 28-9 lead into the locker room at the break. Fred Caruso narrowed the deficit to 28-16 on this two-yard run, but the Eagles closed out the scoring, first on a Ken Kaiser field goal, and then Udinsky's fourth touchdown pass of the day, this one covering 16 yards to Kyle Schuck. Juniata moves to 3-0 for the first time since 2002 with a 38-16 victory over Gettysburg. Franklin Marshall traveled to Collegeville to take on her sinus. E.J. Schneider got the diplomats going with this slant to Jordan Zachary. Zachary goes 34 yards. Coughs up the football, but comes up with the loose ball. Schneider calls his own number going around the left side, 19 yards deep into her sinus territory. That sets up Connor Ryan, his 21-yard field goal, put the Diplomats up 3-0. FNM came right back, Schneider finds Paul Kohler for 20 yards. And then Schneider looks across the middle for Zachary who finds the end zone to put FNM up 9-0 early in the second quarter. The FNM defense picked off Chris Curran in the end zone. Here Aaron Font comes down with the pick for the touchback. After a short punt and a penalty, he gave her science a short field. Curran teamed up with Josh Williams, who takes it down to the one-yard line, setting up Curran on the quarterback sneak to close the Ursinus deficit to 9-7. With time running out in the first half, Ursinus had one last chance on this tip ball. Curran hits Jerry Rahill, who goes deep into FNM territory, 53 yards, but the score remained 9 7 at the break. At the start of the third quarter, Curran flushed out of the pocket, finds Rahill down the right sideline, who takes it 29 yards down to the FNM one yard line. That sets up Jason Golder, who pounds in from the one to give Ursinus a 14 9 lead. The Bears closed out the scoring. As Curran breaks the pocket, finds running room, and goes 57 yards to pay dirt, Ursinus goes on to de defeat Franklin and Marshall 29 and remain unbeaten at 3-0. Johns Hopkins made the trip to the Lehigh Valley to take on Moravian. It was a big day for the Blue Jay ground game here. J.D. Abbott goes around the right side for 10 yards. Then Abbott scores his first touchdown of the day from one yard out to put the Blue Jays up 7-0. Brandon Cherry takes the handoff around the right side, finds some running room, and takes it 34 yards down to the Moravian 5-yard line. From there, Robbie Mady calls his own number and finds the end zone to put the Blue Jays up 14 to nothing. Moravian struggled to get the offense going in the early going. Here, quarterback Robbie Moyer is dropped for a loss. Hopkins would come right back and hand off to Stuart Walters. Walters goes 23 yards down to the Moravian 2-yard line. Walters gets to finish off the drive with a two-yard run, and the Blue Jays are up 21-0 early in the second. Here, Brandon Cherry scores from four yards out, and when Ryan Rice picks off Robbie Moyer, he goes 26 yards to the end zone, and the route was on. Moyer 
did score on two short touchdown runs, but it wasn't enough as Hopkins went on to win 52-14. McDaniel and Muhlenberg put one-on-one -on -one records on the line in West Allentown. On the game's first play, Ryan Yamada is picked off by John Feaster, who takes it deep into McDaniel territory. That sets up Mike Harris, who takes his handoff around the right side 10 yards to give Muhlenberg an early 7-0 lead. Kevin Van Lahr takes this handoff and scores the first of his two touchdowns on the day to give Berg a 14-0 lead. McDaniel came right back. Here, Joe Rollins, the conference's leading rusher, takes the handoff, finds room up the middle, and goes 46 yards deep into Muhlenberg territory. Rollins had 123 yards on the afternoon. The drive stalled there, and the Green Terror called on Bill Caster to try a field goal, but his kick is blocked by Kevin Solari. Corey Crichton picks up the loose ball. Laterals is picked up by Michael Long, who takes it the final 40 yards into the end zone, giving Muhlenberg a 21-0 lead. Freshman quarterback Nick Palladino, who is 23 of 29 on the afternoon, teams up with Co Cody Geyer, who goes 37 yards deep into terror territory. That set up a Connor winner field goal. Next possession. But Brad Haas has his punt blocked by Jeremy Thomas setting up the mules again. Kevin Van Lahr takes the handoff and runs in from 13 yards out to make it 34-0 mules at the half. And when Paladino teams with Michael Long, it makes it 44-0 on the way to a 58-0 Muhlenberg win. Dickinson and Susquehanna met in battle of Owen two teams on the opening possession. Susquehanna marched down the field here. Quarterback Taylor Colmer rolls right. Hits Devin Pasco, who takes it nine yards down to the one yard line. That set up Colmer a one yard quarterback sneak to give the Crusaders a seven nothing lead. Dickinson marched right back down the field, but Susquehanna's defense came up big. Here, Jared Minori recovers the fumble. Dickinson would come right back. Quarterback Cole L breaks free 17 yards into Susquehanna territory. That sets up an L who fakes the right and goes left, five yards to tie the score at seven. Susquehanna would come right back here. Ian Richardson takes the draw 17 yards into the Red Devil territory. Same play, Richardson takes the handoff and goes five yards into the end zone to give Susquehanna 14-7 lead late in the third quarter. Dickinson would come right back. Anel, who gained 154 yards on the ground on the day, picks up 17 on this carry. Here, Anel hands off to Sean Wilson, who goes around the right side, 21 yards, to tie the score at 14 with 11 and a half minutes to go. On the next Dickinson possession, Mike Capone scores from seven yards out as 21-14 Dickinson. Time running out in Susquehanna, they go for it on fourth down, passes incomplete. Adam Kaminsky kicks a 34-yard field goal to give Dickinson a 24-14 lead. The Crusaders wouldn't quit. Colmer looks deep for Kwame Hale, who catches it and goes 67 yards for a touchdown, but it wasn't enough as Dickinson holds on to win. Welcome back to Inside the Huddle. Today, we welcome Muhlenberg head coach Mike Donnelly. Coach, congratulations on a 2-1 and one start. You've had a, a couple of big wins. Uh, what have you seen from the Mules so far that's impressed you, and what things do you think that you need to get better at? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Steve. Uh, we're, we're really happy right now with some of our progress. Um, you know, we, we, have a, we have a lot of the details to clean up. Uh, we've talked to our kids continually about uh, tightening things up. They, they know what they're doing, but that hasn't uh, made its way onto the field in all circumstances. Uh, and we've been sort of in transition right from the get-go. Uh, we lost our starting tailback in the first quarter of the first game. Uh, we lost our second tailback last week for a little bit. Our starting quarterback's down. Uh, you know, so other kids have stepped up. And, you know, when you have those kind of disruptions, it's going to cause some issues. Um, so two out of three games, we're happy. One out of three against F&M, we're not very happy at all. Uh, but, uh, you know, that's the nature of the beast in this league, as you know. Uh, but, but overall, I, I think the one thing I've said since last November is I'm really, really happy with how hard our kids are working, and they're making strides every day to just get better at their craft, which uh, for us on the football field is technique and, and demonstrated knowledge. 
you mentioned some of the early injuries on offense. Uh, Joe Carlucci, senior, uh, started quarterback the opening two games and then got dinged up. Freshman Nick Palladino sort of only stepped in and is impressed in, in his showings in the last two games. Uh, talk about the quarterback situation right now. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, we, we love Joe Carlucci. He's done a great job preparing for the season, was selected as a captain, and he, he's really super, super intelligent. And, and so this was going to be his year to shine, uh, and he started out well. We were very happy with his play. We were very happy with his leadership and his work ethic, uh, you know, setting a pace for the younger kids that they could uh, look at and follow. Uh, you know, it's a funny injury he had. He, he popped some sort of a tendon in his lower leg. It, it's not ankle-related. It's above the ankle. Uh, and he did it on a, when he was stepping the throw. He didn't get hit on a run. Uh, and so we're just going to have to wait to see, uh, you know, how quickly he comes back. But it's definitely not a season-ending thing. It's just a nagging injury. And so, you know, he's done a fantastic job. And what I said to him yesterday was maybe his role is now to be uh, the helper for Trey Brown as we uh, – get Nick Palladino ready to go. Uh, Nick Palladino has done more than, uh, you know, any freshman uh, should have to do as a quarterback, uh, you know, three games in. I don't know what that equals, but I think it's like 30 practices. And he's out there, and he did very, very well in uh, his first start against McDaniel. He, he ran the offense at a very high level, made all of his checks, and uh, we're very, very excited about the future that this young guy has. Let's look at the other side of the ball right now. Uh, Corey Crane and Ian Gimbar were certainly the, the names coming into the season on defense, but Jeremy Thomas has certainly made a name for himself throughout the conference. 18 tackles. He's had a couple of sacks, a fumble recovery, a block kick. Uh, talk about the linebacking core. Well, we're, we're pretty happy with the way he's playing. Jeremy is uh, and was a guy that uh, we knew was one of our better players last year playing in what uh, a lot of people are starting to develop, which is a hybrid guy, a combination strong safety, outside linebacker. He's tremendous in space. Uh, he's very, very hard to block, and he runs well. Um, and he gives us a presence against all the spread offenses that we're seeing. Uh, and we've started to call his number. Uh, you know, we, we practice him with the D-backs, and then he lines up as an outside linebacker in the game um, because he's in space so much. Um, you know, so he's he's been at the apex of the action more often than uh, Ian has been. Uh, Ian's having a really good year so far, but his stats are way down because, uh, you know, he seems to be, after three games, uh, away from the action. And we're, we're doing our best, uh, you know, moving into Hopkins to figure out how to get him at the point of attack more often. Special teams have always been a hallmark uh, of your teams in West Allentown. And certainly last week, uh, certainly made a number of big plays. What makes a team successful at special teams play? Well, you know, that, that's one of the deals where we talk about a level of commitment to special teams. You know, I've actually been on staffs in Division I where the coaches won't give you the time that you need to be good in special teams. And it's just like offense and defense. You need to rep things out. You need to have a little variety. And most importantly, the kids have to see that there's a true commitment by the head football coach to special teams. And so, you know, we have a coordinator, and then we have everybody, including myself, coaching up different parts of each special team. And that gives us a lot of eyes on, uh, you know, the 11 kids that are out there. And we coach to a high level. Uh, we, I, I don't want to say demand but we've got it ingrained that the kids are going to try and win football games with special teams. So, and our kids like it. And so right now, uh, knock on wood, Steve, we're, we are, after three games, pretty happy with the play of our special teams, uh, particularly after limiting, if that can be done, uh, Joe Rollins last week because he's such a dynamic player. Uh, we're going to have another really, really big test of our special teams this Saturday because – uh, Johns Hopkins has really, really good talent uh, on their kick game, as they do throughout their whole team. Let's talk about this week's opponent, the uh, defending champion, Johns Hopkins, uh, welcomes you down to Homewood Field. It's been a terrific series in, in recent memories with a lot of close games. What impresses you on, on film about the Blue Jays? Well, uh, 
you you guys know that they have you know everybody returning quote unquote uh, they have eight offensive starters back uh, by our estimation they have at least seven back on defense and they, these are solid solid players and their coaching is outstanding and their program is outstanding uh, and we're just really really happy that uh, you know we've been able to go battle them tooth and nail over the past decade and uh, you know what impresses me about them is uh, it starts up front they're they're very very tough uh, offensively and they're very big and then defensively they've got their whole front uh, unit back and uh, they get after people so it's not a mystery their quarterbacks good but you know I haven't seen anybody rough them up yet I mean he, he has no problem setting his feet and throwing in the pocket uh, and then conversely uh, they, there is no time for the uh, po opposition quarterbacks to set their feet and throw and so they're running off 80 90 plays a game running and passing and then defensively they go three and out and give it right back to their offense again and at the end of the third quarter every defense that they play including us last year is is tired and so uh, you know they're, they're, they're a very impressive group because uh, not only are they big and strong uh, up front but you know they've got their skill kids us uh, particularly in offense you know their their uh, quarterbacks back all their top wide receivers are back uh, you know it's a pretty good deal for them their tailback who was a second team kid last year who was a Abbott is a very very good football player and a huge back and now he's in the lead role with with a young guy who's just getting on the scene and, and so they seem like they've got uh, talent and then more talent behind them and they're really exactly where everybody in this conference wants to be. 11 of the last 12 years it's been either Johns Hopkins or Muhlenberg taking a share of the title and Saturday they meet at Homewood Field. Uh, promised to be a classic. Muhlenberg head coach Mike Donnelly, thanks for joining us today on Inside the Huddle. Thanks, Steve.